Right, the reading this morning is taken from James chapter 2, verses 1 to 8, and also 14 to 16. And I'm reading from the New King James's version, verses 1 to 8. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you'll pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves, and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfil the royal law, According to the scripture, you shall love your neighbour as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And now I'm reading from verse 14 to 16. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Amen. Well, when I came in this morning wearing my quadrophenia parka, nobody took a blind bit of notice until I took it off. <laughs> I thought I'd start with a bit of a gimmick this morning um, because James is talking about this very same thing as Janet read. Um, and boy, did I get some comments. Oh, whoa. Oh. One, I like your tie. It enhances your face. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Another comment was, it's about time. About time what? You're smarting yourself up. And then one said, oh, I like your jacket. That's posh, isn't it? They didn't know it only cost me four quid from a charity shop. Well, there you go. Well, that was, it. That was just to make a point. One thing I like about Redeemer King is you can come as you are. Yeah? Because that's the Christian way, as you are. Jesus welcomes everybody irrespective of who, what, wherefore. So let's kick off with James. And I've put a little cartoon up there. Yeah, we do things for people not because of who they are, what they do in return, but of who we are. Who we are. And James very much centres on that. Now, um... Love in action is the theme this morning. Love in action. This is what James is on about, basically. Ali did a fantastic job of doing the background work last week, so that saved me some hassle. Thank you very much, Ali. did a tremendous job. One of the key things I got out of that was the word wisdom. And I think if you keep that as a thread throughout reading James, it helps. Yeah, James was written about AD 48, and it's a message for first generation Jewish Christians concerning Christian conduct amidst persecution, amidst a society of look after yourself, dog eat dog, political upheaval, social 
uh, deprivation and basically uh, uncertain times where maybe the law of survival was uh, the issue of the day. So he, James, comes in from time to time with a blunt approach straight from the shoulder. Like, for instance, don't hold faith with partiality. It, don't hold faith in Jesus with partiality. In other words, don't discriminate. And another one, faith without works is dead. Straight to the point. In other words, if you're supposed to be a Christian, act like one. It's this kind of sentiment. You know, when you sign up, when you sign on the dotted line as Jesus, accepting Jesus as Saviour, don't forget also you accept him as Lord. And that's the bit that he punches home. And of course this is a contrast in Roman times, as I've already explained. Partiality is the thing. Then I'll just split this into three parts. So if you could uh, stick there, oh dear, I don't really can read that, but anyway, there we are, right? We'll uh, hike through it. Partiality, the royal law, and faith and works. So it covers three parts. Uh, we could have read the whole of James chapter 2, but it's quite a lengthy passage. Uh, so I've split it as accordingly. Partiality is about externals, about s seeing people or seeing situations, particularly people we're on about, on the external. In other words, how we weigh people up. How we weigh people up. People watching. Have we all done it? I've done it. We all do it. We all do people watching. You know, it's part of nature. It's part of nature to weigh people up. It's part of the... You know, self self protection, preservation. Sometimes, certainly living in a world of trickery and deceit and dodgy people, uh, you know, it's it's necessary. We have we, we do that. It's a defence mechanism to a certain extent. But it's not on about this. It's on about specifically discriminating, showing partiality, particularly in the uh, first generation church as well, as it was finding its feet. Notice sometimes when we meet people for the first time, it usually comes down to the first things, you know, how do you do? What do you do for a living? What do you do? What do you do? That usually comes up first, doesn't it? And that could determine a little bit of where we're going to go with the decision making a little bit. Where do you live? It's another one. Where do you live? Oh, 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 oh. Reac interesting reactions. Beliefs. Beliefs. What do you believe in? Do you believe? Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yes. Oh, I go to church. Oh, how long have you been a Christian? You know, interesting that one, isn't it? That's a favourite. How long have you been? Oh, yeah. When I was growing up, I, uh, we didn't have a telly. We didn't have a bathroom. We're talking about the late 1950s. Yeah, I'm knocking on a bit. You can work that one out. And it reminds me of this bit of a, a song of John Pickering's. I was born in a terrace row, two rooms above, two rooms below. Old tin bath hanging by the door, outside loo, who could ask for more? You thought you got everything. Tin bath, Friday night. Yeah, and the water got a bit cool. Your mother had come in with a kettle full of boiling water. Whoa, steady on. Yeah, get it near the fire. Stoke up. My dad was a miner, plenty of coal. And that side of the bath could really get warm. You shoved it about. Yeah, them were the days. Then somebody down the road had a telly, black and white, BBC. And, of course, if you're lucky, you, you know, you... you your mates might just invite you around to see Andy Pandy or something on the box. Black and white. Them were the days. But then, my dad, he saved his money, hard-earned cash. He was a coal face worker, and then he was a painter and decorator in his spare time. And he bought himself a brand new 1955 Ford Zephyr. Six-cylinder, 
Whoa! Where are we going up now, eh? Look at us. We ain't got a telly. Um, we've still got the tin bath, but we've got a good set of wheels. There it is. Well, you know, we when we meet people and we discriminate and make these decisions, it's sometimes because we want to be accepted as well. You know how it goes. It's a, it's a strange situation. Well, the thing is that reading externals can lead to preconceived ideas in the heart. And this is where it's going in here with James, I believe. Preconceived ideas, making a quick assessment, affecting behaviour, creating wrong motives. And this is what James was on about. It's not saying be careful, it's saying be wise. It's saying be wise. Remember this. James, I believe James is saying this. But re remember that we are all on a spiritual path. All of us, even those that don't know Jesus yet, are on a spiritual path. We've all had to start somewhere. We've all had to start somewhere on this spiritual path. God is impartial, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 10. God sees us, sees the world as we might say, vertically, from above. He sees the big picture. We only see things horizontally, the little picture. We attempt to operate on that plane. God sees the whole thing. So, if we could, are only operating on one line, one plane, then the model that we get in in James is it suggests that the whole thing is out of kilter, as they say. It needs to be brought in to God's pattern, God's equation for wholeness and completeness in him. Faith and works combine. And remember, oh, that's a good idea. <coughs> faith without works, there it is. Thank you, man of faith and works. Yeah, remember where you've come from. This is what he's saying. Remember where you've come from. Somebody once has said to me, uh, oh, you do a spot of preaching, do you? I said, oh, well, occasionally I get dragged in, yes. yes. When they scrape the barrel and they can't find anything. I said, oh, are you qualified? I said, well, have you got letters after your name? Oh, here we go. Oh, I hate that sort of, that sort of talk. Yes. SSBG. What's that? Sinner saved by grace. How's that? That'll do. So it brings us on to the second point, too. The royal law. The royal law. Here it is. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbour as yourself, you will do well. Great. It's about people, this game is saying. It's about people. The heart of the Ten Commandments. Now, Jesus, in the, when we look at the royal law, Jesus puts two parts of the law together. First of all, he puts the Shema, first of all. He quotes the Shema in the Old Testament, and it's this. And we pick this up in Matthew chapter 22. If you've got your Bibles, look at Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. And he says this in Deuteronomy... The Jewish Shema, which is said twice a day, both evening and morning and evening, says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That's the main part of it. Jesus qualifies this in Matthew 22. And when I find it, but I'll 
should be able to know it. He says this, that you've heard it said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength and, and mind. You've heard that said. This was the first commandment and the greatest commandment. And the second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he puts the two together, doesn't he? And makes it in to a singularity of purpose. A singularity. He fulfills the, and the completeness of the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments are there um, meant for man's, to uh, explain man's respect for God. Commandment number one, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Number two, don't worship any graven image. Number three, don't misuse the God's name. Number four, respect the Sabbath. That's all, what God just wants that bit, just those four. And then he says the rest, the remaining sixth, uh, for man's duty to his fellow man. Respect your parents, don't commit murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't tell lies, don't bear false witness, in other words, and don't covet. And so he brings the two together, God and man, the royal law, and it's fulfilled in that way. In other words, if you love God, you love people, yeah? If you love God, you love people. It's a people game as well as a God game. And we get the impression that what James is trying to say here is, work at it. <laughs> you know, work at it. We don't always get it right the first time or second time or third time. Work at it. Yeah, there are people that uh, are difficult to like. They mind love. There are people who are obnoxious <laughs> who in life. People who have problems that we don't understand. And we have to learn to try and understand them. That's loving our neighbour. Trying to stand in their shoes. Trying to respect who they are and what bad deal they might have had that's caused probably them to live in that particular way. Who knows? So God sees, this sees God as a singularity with man grafted into the vine forming what you might call a, a total, an irre, irreducible singularity, grafted into the vine. John chapter 15, I, I, the, the vine, Jesus is the vine, you are grafted into the vine, you are part of the vine, part of me, I'm part of you, work with me, we are one. We can't separate that, you can't change that. That is what the Christian life is meant to be. That's what it's supposed to be. God is love. Vertical. Love in action. Horizontal. Love is the prime mover of the universe. This gets us then to the third bit. Faith and works. Just have a drink. James seems to drive it home pretty strong here. He really seems to give it a punch. And if I read here, I'll read this bit from verse 14 onwards. Listen, sorry, where am I? What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith alone save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one says to him or says to them, Oh, depart in peace, keep yourself warm, be filled, and you don't give them the things that they need, what good's that? You know, good luck. Look after yourself. Keep safe. Keep warm. Pray for you. Oh, I'll pray for you. What good does that? What's good is that? Thus also, faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. Faith without works is dead. It's no good sitting in your little holy huddles, is more or less saying. 
it's no good being so heavenly minded, you know, earthly use, he's saying. Does it mean then that only Christians can do good works? No, it doesn't. Heaven forbid. There's some fantastic works that are gone in the world that, are, that aren't done by Christians, that are done out by people just because they're good people, you know? And I think we as Christians can learn a terrific amount from some of the things that people do for humanity. Acts of kindness and love and how they devote their life for, for other people. Yeah. It's not saying that at all. But what it is saying is this. Please don't think that that is the way to heaven. Don't think that you can say, oh, you know, I've, look at me, I've done all this, that. You know, don't boast, don't boast, don't boast about being kind to your fellow man. Don't boast about that. That's what you're supposed to do. But don't think it's a way to heaven. Don't think it's a backdoor approach. Don't think that if you get up, if you clock up these brownie points, then you'll get into heaven. Don't work that way. There's no such thing as a cheap grace. It doesn't work. But neither does self-righteousness work on the other side. You know, oh well, I don't need to go to church. I don't need all that stuff. I'm good enough anyway. That's self-righteousness on the other side as well, isn't it? Our deeds are not the basis of our salvation. Our deeds are the evidence of our salvation. This is what he's saying. We are saved by grace, through faith, Ephesians chapter 2. Our deeds are an indication, a witness, that a work of Jesus has taken place in our hearts and lives. That's what our works are. That's what we are expected to do. There's never smoke without this fire. You know, if you see smoke, it's evidence that there's something burning somewhere. When I was about 11 year old, my mother caught me smoking in the garden shed. Me and my mate, well, boy, were we fagging it. Were we giving it one? And the smoke must have been coming out all the cracks and windows and gaps in the roof and goodness knows. It must have, you probably thought the shed was on fire. Next thing, the door bursts open and she's standing there, arms folded. Got you. Red-handed. There's never smoke without this fire. The same with our works. Our works are smoke. Smoke indicating there's a fire. There's a fire within. We accept Jesus as Lord. We are not relieved of our duty. This is what we could call our job description. It's expected. And sometimes when I read Matthew chapter 25, it really brings me up sharp. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And so on, and so on, and so on. It's called the parable of the talents. We've been given a gift. And we've all been given personal gifts within our lives whereby we can minister to others, whoever, whatever they are. It doesn't matter where we've come from, what they've been, or whatever. We're all on a path, we're all on a journey. We all have to start somewhere. I love things like aeroplanes and ships and things like that. And whenever I see warships in a harbour, I think how magnificent they look. Bristling with armament, bristling with tech, bristling with a job needed to do. But you know, they're not designed to stay in a harbour. They're designed to stay out there in rough water, to, to, to brave the waves, to take the flak, to do a job. 
to be a ministry, and that's us. The early Methodists, 1700s, Britain apparently was on its knees, according to the historians. More or less, heading just towards the end of that century, we find the French Revolution. Britain was heading in that direction itself. According to the historians, the Methodist revival was a, was a, a godsend. It boosted morale. It, brought, it got people to, to feel good, not about themselves, but about it gave them purpose. The Methodist revival. That's why they were called Methodists, Wesleyans, because they were methodical, practical, not just so heavenly minded that they're no earthly use. They were practical as well. Balance. It's all about balance. We can study theology till it comes out of our ears. I've just recited basically the Ten Commandments from memory. But what good does that do me if I don't put it into practice? Waste of time. Waste of mental energy. I might as well read a book. Go for a walk. It's that kind of thing. We can have our holy huddles. That's fine. That's good. Don't stop meeting together. Sure, let's get it right. But, but it's about balance. William Wilberforce. Look at his story. I love the story about jo George Muller. During the turn of the last century, uh, we prayed for a, an, or an orphanage to bring to to help the poor down and out kids in the back streets of London and roundabout. He prayed apparently for a million pounds in those days, and he got it. That's faith, isn't it? And works. Wow, what a story! Mother Teresa of Calcutta used to say, "Whenever I see." the sick, the dying, and people in need, I see Jesus in another guise. Jesus in another guise. In other words, the invisible Jesus. This is, this is, this is for us. Look for the invisible Jesus. We've sung about it a little bit. It's come into what we've been singing. The invisible Jesus. The vertical and the horizontal this irreducible singularity, posh word, but basically that's what I'm trying to say, the royal law, action. And then, it doesn't stop there, it goes off the screen. It goes completely off the screen. It goes into the red line. Love God, love your neighbour. But then in Luke chapter 6, it really lays the gauntlet down. <laughs> love your enemies. Now that's a test. That's a test. And I'm not quite sure how you, some people do that. You know, I've had a few little enemies on my life, not big enemies, enemies. We've all had them, from school to wherever. And sometimes it takes a long, 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 long time to forgive them. And we've got to work at it sometimes. I'm certainly no expert on that one. Could you put the next thing up, please, sir? Thank you. you. Just look at that. Love your enemies. December the 14th, 1862. One of the bloodiest battles in the American Civil War took place in the town of Fredericksburg, Virginia, on December the 11th, 1862. 200,000 combatants co collided, the, uh, the Union against the Confederates on both sides. Snowy, freezing, swampy conditions, and for six hours the battle raged on. Sergeant Kirkland decided enough was enough, took it on his own bat to collect as many water canteens as he possibly could, and walked into no man's land, that was a bit between the two opposing battles, and started to, to give the, the, the dying, the wounded, the distressed, a drink, straightened out broken limbs, a kind word, and went through one after another, after another, after another, risking his life, risking everything, 
And during that time, the whole fighting stopped. What an amazing, amazing picture. Love in action. That says it all, doesn't it? Says it all. That's a challenge. My goodness, don't we need that today with what's going on? I can't get my head around it. You know, I'm going to try and sum up a little bit here because we, we're moving on. Uh, it's soon be time for tea time. <laughs> it takes us back to the beginning, all this. We're on a journey. We're on a journey. We're on a path. Faith in action is love in action. Love in action, sorry, faith in action is love. Love in action is God in action. Action doesn't always have to be physical either, does it? A smile is action. A kind look is action. A thought and a prayer is action. All action stems from the heart, as we said right at the beginning. Right at the beginning, it's a heart experience. How we weigh people up. We live and move and have our being. It says in Acts chapter 17. Genuineness is a powerful action. Genuineness, when we meet people. Remember who we are. Remember where we've come from. Remember we've been, we've been bought for a terrible price. Genuineness. Empathy. Try walking in another man's shoes. Empathy. Woman's shoes. Anybody's shoes. Humility, powerful action. This is Jesus, building up a picture of Jesus here. Kindness, what a beautiful world, kindness, kindness. And forgiveness, yeah, forgiveness, that's a big one, a very big one. And it's all about grace, isn't it? And here I go again, and I've said it before, and I'll mean it. What I say when I say grace is the final frontier. <laughs> Not space, grace is the final frontier. Because it's the highest form of love that we can ever witness anywhere. In this world and the next. The ultimate act of love was grace. Salvation. Martin Luther called this the great exchange. The great exchange. I don't know whether you've come across this or not. He called it the great exchange. And I'm going to read something now. And sometimes I struggle to read this because I get emotional about it. So I'm going to have to focus a bit on this. And it's this. Four prison walls thickened with fear, hurt, and hate surround us. We are incarcerated by our past, our low road choices in our high-minded pride. We've been found guilty. We sit on the floor of a dusty cell awaiting our final moment. Our executioner's footsteps echo against the stone walls. Head between knees, we don't look up as he opens the door. We don't open our eyes as he begins to speak. We know what he's going to say. Time to pay for your sins. But then you hear something else. You're free to go. They took Jesus instead of you. Yeah. They took Jesus instead of you. The door swings open. The guard barks, get out. And we find ourselves in the light of the morning sun. Shackles gone, crime pardoned, wondering what's happened. Grace happened. Christ took away your sins. Love in action, eh? Let's just pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. 
Thank you that you died on that cross for me and for others, for countless numbers. And Lord, I just pray, I just ask that if there's anybody here today that's never accepted Jesus as Saviour, then don't mess about. Just do it. You don't have to make a fuss and palaver. We don't have to uh, embarrass anybody. You can ask Jesus into your life in the privacy of your own room. Just tell him that you need him. You tell him that you've not exactly got things right in life. Tell him that you've made a mess of things even. Repentance, that's all that is. It's easy. Decide, make the decision. But ask him to come in, the saviour of the world, the love in action. Christ, the living Lord. Amen. Thank you.